Good morning. Good morning. So glad to have you all here today. It's such a beautiful day outside. Uh, why don't you all stand and join us as we begin our worship today.
It is always nice to greet one another. And as you find your seats, we're going to go ahead and continue worshiping the Lord today. It is not a first Sunday of the month when we often take communion. It is always good to remember the cross of Christ. Uh, we've sung about the cross. We remember what Christ has done for us, and that is a cause for great celebration. Uh, we sang, started out by singing the song, The Days of Elijah, which is also a reminder for us that the Christ who died on the cross is right now preparing a place for us and one day soon he's coming to take us to be with him forever and so we say like john in the book of revelation even so come quickly lord jesus it's sometimes easy to read the bible and think about all the things god did thousands of years ago 
but we remember that same God is active in our lives today, and every day we should be looking for his return, coming back for us. And so that's a, a great reminder for us as we gather together to worship, we're not just remembering what God did years ago, but we're celebrating what he's doing today and looking forward to what he's going to do for us in the future. It is good to have you with us this morning. I know that uh, many of us have prayer requests and I'd always encourage you to share your requests with somebody else so that, uh, that others can join you in praying for the needs that are heavy on your heart. Uh, but we wanna go to prayer and then following the prayer, the ushers will come and we will receive our offerings as we give back to honor the Lord. But uh, before they come, let's pray together. Father, it is good to know that as me we meet for worship, you are here present with us and you are an ever present help in time of need. And Lord, it's good to know that we can cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. For us. Each one of us here has a special need, a special burden. And so Lord, uh, we, we humbly ask for your help. And then Lord, it is a joy to know that we can honor you. Uh, when we think of you, the God of all creation, there's nothing you need but what we can do is give you our honor. And so, Lord, we acknowledge your presence with us as we give back our tithes and offerings today. Uh, may you use them for your glory. Lord, remind us to turn to you every day for your help. Uh, help us never to think that we can handle life on our own because we admit we can't. We desperately need your help. So thank you, Lord, that as we meet for worship, you're here with us. We ask your blessing on our continued worship in this service now. In Jesus' name, amen.
like a crown Coming to kiss the feet of mercy I lay every burden down At the foot of the cross I'll trade these ashes in for beauty And when forgiveness like a crown the feet of mercy. I lay every burden down. I lay every burden down. I lay every burden down at the foot of the Jesus tells us in Scripture, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. Uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. When we try to handle all of our problems ourselves, it is a heavy weight, a great burden. But when we cast our cares on the Lord, we find it's so much easier to live with joy. Because we don't have to carry our burdens. He takes care of those burdens for us. Uh, this morning, let me pass on uh, three announcements for you. Number one, following the worship service. Jana, where would you like to meet? Which, um, here. Right up front here on this side, uh, we'll have a Christian Ed meeting. Uh, we're going to talk about Sunday school, youth group, Bawana, all things Christian education. We'd love to have your input. So if you can stay a few extra minutes, Janet is going to lead us in that meeting, and uh, we'd love to have your input. You say, well, I'll stay after. I normally take off right away. Many times, people leave as soon as the amen is said, or even during the last song sometimes. But when you do that, you don't get to build close friendships and fellowships. I actually grew up in a church where it would be an hour after the service and people were still standing around talking. But to help facilitate then that fellowship, we're having a church picnic on September 15th out at the home of Rick and Sharon Wood at 1 p.m. So if you come to church and want to just hang out for a while, bring a dish with you, great. You can just make your way out to the woods then, or if you say, well, I'm going to run home quick and grab my stuff and change and then get out there, that's fine too. That's why we're having it at 1 p.m. So 1 p.m., picnic at the woods house. Bring, the meat will be provided. We'll have the tableware. If you bring a passing dish, a dessert, uh, bring your fishing pole, bring your lawn chairs, bring your croquet set, whatever. We'll have a great afternoon together on September 15th. Uh, third announcement, I'm actually going to do four. Third announcement, I'm going to go up to a men's retreat in uh, south of Traverse City on September 27th through 29th. So any men interested in going up, uh, you can see me if you'd like to come along with me. I know there's also men's retreats up at Camp Barakal as well. It's a great place. There's different things out in the bulletin board there about that. But then the, oh, the other fourth announcement, I wanted to pass on for you. A number of weeks now, we've had something in the bulletin about compassion about a compassion child there is a ministry called compassion international that will take children and they bring them into a they actually work through local churches all across the world in all these different countries and they bring the children in for classes they teach them about hygiene they provide uh, vitamins dental care they give them training about scriptures they they share the love of god with them 
uh, they teach them to read and write and so many things. And compassion works through a one-on-one -on -one sponsorship. So they don't just say, oh, we've got these children, bring in a lot, you know, just send us your money. No, they say, here's a child who needs sponsored. We want somebody to sponsor this child. So as a church, we'd like to sponsor a child. Some of you may sponsor a child individually. That's great. Uh, but as a church, we are looking at sponsoring a child. It costs $38 a month. And so the missions committee said, well, we're going to build up a fund first to cover sort of a year's worth of sponsorship just to make sure we have that money there. So as the money comes in, uh, we will then, when we get up to $500, we're going to pick a child and start that sponsorship. So if you would like to help contribute toward that, just put your donation market compassion. Uh, and we've, we've had about a third of the money has come in already. And so when the, when the rest of the money comes, we will uh, sponsor a child. We'll be able to start writing to a child. We'll get their picture. We'll get updates from them. They'll send us letters. So it will be a wonderful relationship for our church and this child that we choose. Uh, but if you'd like to have a part in that, this, uh, when you put your donations in the offering, just mark it Compassion, and we'll use that to help sponsor the child through Compassion International. This morning we are in Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter of the first book in the Bible, Genesis 50. We have been looking at the life of Joseph, and this morning we finish up the story of Joseph's father, Jacob. We finish up the story of Joseph. Last week we saw Jacob, Joseph's father, the father of the 12 tribes, the, the 12 boys, and one daughter, Dinah. Can you imagine having 13 kids in your family? Uh, maybe some of them might here may have been raised in a family with that many, uh, but that is a handful. 13 kids. As Jacob is ready to die, he wants to pass on a blessing to each of his children. So we saw that last week. If you missed it, uh, you can go online, Bethelfree.org, and you can find their past uh, sermons, and you can review anything that you might have missed. So we pick up the, his death in chapter 49, and in verse 33, it says, When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. So Jacob dies. He is gathered to his people. So the first question to ask as we read this is, who are his people? And how is Jacob gathered to his people? To truly understand that shows one of the key questions in life. Is this life all there is? We would say, no, of course not. My hope is in heaven and being with God forever. But sadly, there are many in society who will tell us there is no life after death. There is nothing beyond this earthly life. There is no God. There is no eternity. It's just this life here on earth, here and now, after we die, we cease to exist. Stephen Hawking, you know, supposedly brilliant scholar, and yet he thought, no, nope, we're, just, we're just like machines and we just cease to function when we die. Nothing exists. Uh, Richard Dawkins, many famous atheists. No, nah, there's nothing beyond that. But how sad to think that this life would be all there is. Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 15, the great chapter about the resurrection. He says, if this life is all there is, then our faith is vain. He says, my preaching is vain. We're most hopeless. We are to be pitied more than all men. He goes on to say, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. And that is the motto for many people. We'll just live it up today, go for all the gusto, because, you know, got to get it now, because there's nothing coming in the future. But the Bible makes it clear. This life is not all there is. 
This life is just a split second of an eternity. Billions upon billions of years will be just the first second of what awaits us. And so we understand that when we die, that is just the beginning of an eternity. Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter in the scripture, describes many of the great heroes of faith. And it goes through and talks about all these great heroes. And it ends the chapter by telling us, these were all commended for their faith yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So our hope is that when we die, we are going to rejoin Moses and Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and all these saints of the Old Testament because they all died in faith and they're waiting to join us and every other believer in Jesus Christ. So, as Jacob is gathered to his people, he goes to rejoin his grandfather Abraham, his father Isaac, his mother Rebekah, his favorite wife Rachel who had died. He joins Noah and Melchizedek and Adam and Seth and all the heroes of the faith. When I die, I also will be gathered to my people, joining all of them. But, you know, I think about my mother who died in January, and I will get to be with my mother again, my father who died a few years ago, rejoining loved ones who died. My neighbor Ruth Keller lived across the street from, or right next to us, loved God with all of her heart, uh, held a, a, a neighborhood Bible club. Even though she was in her 70s, she bring young children into her home every week to teach them Bible lessons. Who will you get to see when you are gathered to your people? One of the great hopes that we have is thinking about loved ones who have died, who we will rejoin when we die. So many times we think about death as a tragedy. But the greatest tragedy would be to die without faith. To die with no hope of an eternity with God and with our loved ones. So I'm going to start the sermon today in a very unusual way. Many times sermons end with an invitation. An invitation to place your faith in Christ. I'm going to start this morning with an invitation as we talk about being gathered to our people. God has a home prepared for those who place their faith in Him. The sad truth is, though, that many die without faith. Many die never turning to Christ. When we lived in Fort Wayne, we had a neighbor across the street. And I won't mention her name because we put this out on the internet. But she said, I believe in God. I believe the Bible. But I'm not ready to place my faith in Christ for salvation. She says, I know I need to do it, but I'm not ready to do it yet. And to the best of my knowledge, she never has. I've never heard that she has placed her faith in Christ. You may be here today, and you say, oh yeah, I believe in God. I believe the Bible. But it's sort of like a train. You might know a train will take you to Chicago, but unless you actually get on the train, you never get to Chicago. You might say, yeah, I believe in God. I, I believe Jesus died on the cross. But each one of us needs to come to the point of personal faith where we say, I am willing to trust what Jesus has done for me. I'm not trusting my good works, trying to be a good person. I am willing to trust Jesus and receive his forgiveness. 
That's what many of us have done. I, I trusted Christ as my personal Savior as a little boy about five years old. I grew up hearing about God and going to church every week. But at five years old, I understood that I needed personally to receive Christ. If there's anyone here today, even before we get into the sermon, because you might not make it to the end of the sermon, if you need to trust Christ, to place your faith in Jesus, you want to make sure your faith is in Jesus and not just on hoping so, wishing so, you want to know for sure your faith is in Jesus. Come meet me at the front. I'd be glad to pray with you and we can settle that right now. Is there anybody here that says, I, I haven't placed my faith in Jesus, I believe in God, but I know I need to do that today. Is there anyone here who wants to come and make sure? I know most of you, know many of you have done that. And I hope that each one of you has personal faith. As Jacob dies, he is gathered to his people. Let's pray as we continue on in the passage. Father, I thank you today that we have that great hope hope of living for eternity with you our god and savior we will see you face to face we will worship you and serve you and love you and share eternity with all our brothers and sisters in christ and now as we continue on in genesis chapter 50 teach us lessons about death teach us lord to look at death not just as a tragedy and as a loss but a, as a time of great rejoicing and celebration teach us from what we see in your word today we ask in jesus name amen chapter 50 of the book of genesis we see jacob dies and then we learn some lessons from joseph joseph remains alive along with his brothers so how will he honor his father far too often we don't give honor the way we should how far would you go to honor the death of those you love? In Joseph's case, it was about a thousand miles and a couple months of his life to honor his father. So, learning from Joseph, the first thing we learn is to embrace emotion. Chapter 50, verse 1. Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him. And kissed him when his father Jacob finally dies Joseph who is 57 at this time weeps openly and strongly mourning is a way to show honor in fact the Jewish culture had an established system of mourning and they would even hire mourners to come join them in mourning their loved one it was often accompanied by dressing in burlap it was called sackcloth back then by weeping by fasting by ripping your garments sadly in our culture today we want to get over it as quick as possible we try to to not show any emotion we try to not show that we're bothered or not show that we're grieving but mourning is actually a way to show honor. There was a day in our society, granted it was a generation or two ago, where those who lost a loved one would dress in black, or they, they would go to work and they'd wear a black armband, and everyone who saw that knew, oh, they are grieving the loss of someone who was dear to them. Grieving used to be a part of our culture, but sadly, more and more we have lost the ability to grieve and to show emotion look in verse 3 it says and the egyptians mourned for him 70 days two and a half months of mourning after two and a half hours we expect a person to move on and say fine you had the funeral now get on with life but mourning is part of showing honor to the person who has died you look down in verse 10 they they take the funeral procession and it says when they reached the threshing floor of a todd near the jordan they lamented loudly and bitterly and there joseph observed a seven day period of mourning for his father so after two and a half months of mourning they have the funeral 
And as they do, they take another week to pause and to mourn some more. Our society is so different. There is a funeral home up in Saginaw that has a drive through viewing. You don't even get out of your car to go in and greet the family. You just pull up, and there's a little strip there. When it senses your car pulls up, the curtains open, some music plays, and after you pull away, three minutes later, the curtains close back again. And sadly, there is no mourning, no grieving when you're doing a drive through viewing. How are you supposed to pay your respects when you're driving through? Not Joseph. Joseph embraces all the emotion that floods his soul as he grieves over the death of his father. The second thing we learn from Joseph is celebrate with ceremony. As Joseph grieves, he goes through great ceremony to celebrate his father. Verse 2, Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. So the physicians embalmed him, taking a full 40 days, for that was the time required for embalming. What this is literally saying is they made a mummy out of Jacob. Somewhere in the Middle East, there is a sarcophagus with a mummy inside that is the petrified remains of J Jacob's body. What's interesting is that was a special process reserved for pharaohs, reserved for the elite of society. In fact, they mourned 70 days for Jacob. They mourned 72 days for pharaohs. So Jacob is elevated to such a high honor in their society. And Joseph went through full ceremony to honor his father. What do we hear people say today? Ah, just bury me in a pine box. Ah, just burn me, just spread my ashes out back in the garden. Don't make a big fuss over me. But Joseph embraces ceremony to honor his father. We see the same thing in the life of Jesus. Remember the story in Mark 14 of the woman who comes with the box of alabaster, alabaster box of ointment and she pours this ointment out to anoint the feet of Jesus. It could have sold for a year's wages. So she's got a little box of perfume that is worth $50,000. And she pours it out on the feet of Jesus. Judas is upset because he carries the money pouch. He says, we could have sold that, put the money in the pot. He's thinking, I could have bought a lot with that. And Jesus says, she did it to prepare me for my death. Honoring the death of those we love with ceremony. So Joseph embraces ceremony as a way of honoring his father. Then look in verse 7. We should involve others in this ceremony. So Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court and all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. So Joseph doesn't grieve privately. Rather, he brings together a great celebration to honor his father Jacob. Jacob had been like a father to Pharaoh. Pharaoh loved Joseph, and when Joseph brought his father down, Jacob became well-loved by the nation of Egypt. So all of Pharaoh's dignitaries join in this ceremony to bury Jacob. Talk more about that ceremony in just a little bit. But the next thing Joseph does is he follows through on commitments. Joseph had made some commitments to his father before he died. And it can be easy, once a loved one is dead, to forget those commitments. To say, well, yeah, I know, I told Dad that, or I promised Mom that I'd do such and so, but they're dead now. I don't have to do that. Not Joseph. Joseph follows through on the commitments. Verse 12, So Jacob's sons did as he had commanded them. 
they carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which Abraham had bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. So Jacob told Joseph and his brothers what he wanted done, and Joseph followed through. He kept his commitments. He honored his father by fulfilling his father's wishes. So why was it such an important thing for Jacob to be buried back in Canaan? After all, he had spent the last 17 years of his life down here in Egypt. Why bother to take his body all the way back to Canaan? And the answer is that it is very important because Jacob knew that even though his family had it good now, even though they were enjoying all that Egypt had to offer, even though Joseph is the one calling the shots in the nation, second in charge under Pharaoh, yet this was just a rest stop for them. This was not the destination. Jacob knew that the promises of God were centered on the land of Israel. And that while Egypt was wonderful, it was not home. Jacob knew that his family would be returning to the land. How did Jacob know? Well, God promised his grandfather Abraham. God said, Abraham, your descendants are going to live in Canaan here, then they're going to go down to Egypt. They're going to end up being slaves, but after 430 years, I'm going to bring them back to this land of Canaan, the promised land, the land of Israel. So Jacob knew that even though they were in Egypt, they would not end up there, but that they would return. So this wasn't about being buried in a family cemetery plot. It was more about faith in the promises of God. And so it was crucial to Jacob to extract this promise from Joseph that he would take his body back to Canaan to be buried. That's what we see over in chapter 47, verse 29. When the time drew near for Israel to die, and Israel is another name for Jacob, it's his nickname, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh. Now, there's a unique way to make a promise. No, give me your hand on this, let's shake on it. No, put your hand under my thigh to make the promise. And promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt. But when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. I will do as you say, he said. Swear to me, he said. Then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Think about this. Jacob is now 147 years old, and he calls his son Joseph in to talk to him about his death. Joseph is the son who has been his favored son. And after all, Joseph uh, has done in bringing his father and all the family down to Egypt, moving the family there, giving them the best land, caring for them the last 17 years. If Jacob had any doubts about his son's love for him, they should have vanished long ago. But in spite of all this, when Jacob asked Joseph to bury him in Canaan, Joseph says, okay, I'll do it. Notice Jacob says, swear to me. Now, we would think, if Joseph says, I'll do it, what well, would we say? Oh, thanks, I knew I could count on you. Not Jacob. He says, I want you to bury me. Promise you're going to bury me in Canaan. Joseph says, okay, I'll do it. He says, swear. Swear you're going to do it. And Joseph swears. And then he's able to worship. So why isn't Joseph's word good enough for him? There's something deeper going on here. Notice the next thing that happens. Joseph swears and Jacob, also called by the nickname of Israel, worships on the top of his staff. Some translations say he bows in worship at the head of his bed. 
Jacob is almost blind. He is largely bedridden. After all, he's 147 years old now. But when Joseph swears he will bury him in Canaan, in the family grave plot, Jacob worships God. Why does Jacob worship? Because it is at this point when Joseph swears to him that he sees that Joseph is choosing to worship him as his father. You say, well, of course he's his father. Why would there be any doubt about it? Jacob was the father to the 13 kids. Of course he is father to Joseph. But evidently there was a question about this. Because if you look at the moment Jacob dies, what takes place? Joseph weeps. And then you'd think if he hadn't already talked to Pharaoh about this, that he'd go to Pharaoh, get permission to leave for the funeral and take his father back to Canaan. But that is not what happens. The first thing that Joseph does is to embalm his father. They make a mummy out of him. But let's remember, that's not something that the Jews did. That was an Egyptian process. Egyptians viewed the dead body as the vehicle to take you to some other world beyond our own. And now, consider what it was that Jacob wanted done to his body. He wanted, wanted it buried in the ground, put back into the ground, where it would go back into the dust of the ground. Burial and embalming, two very opposite ways of treating the dead body. Burial, the Israelite custom, facilitates the body's return to the dust. The Old Testament states, you're dust and to dust you will return. Egyptians would be horrified at the notion of burying one of their royalty. Why do such a thing? You're destroying their vehicle to the afterlife. So the first thing Joseph does is to embalm his father. Following 40 days of grieving and embalming, there are 30 more days of grieving, not just by Joseph, but by all Egypt. Joseph is a favored son. And so his father is a loved figure in Egypt. His burial was going to be a state funeral full of pomp and circumstance. So how do you think Pharaoh would respond if Joseph said, we're going to bury the body. And we're going to bury it back in this little spot way out of Egypt, back in the land of Canaan. So during those 30 extra days of grieving, Joseph says nothing to Pharaoh about this yet. And then when he finally does speak, he goes the roundabout way about it. He tries to avoid a direct confrontation. Look at verse 4. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, If I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him, my father made me swear an oath and said, I'm about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. So Joseph is trying to ruffle any feathers. He doesn't want Pharaoh to get upset. He says, he goes to some people in Pharaoh's court. He doesn't even go to Pharaoh himself. He goes to friends and says, would you go and talk to Pharaoh for me? And tell him my father made me promise this. Why does he do that? Because in reality, Pharaoh has made himself a father to Joseph. So Jacob is Joseph's father, but Pharaoh has assumed the role of father as well. Remember that Joseph had been kidnapped, sold off as a slave to Egypt when he was only 17 years old. He languished in prison for many years until Pharaoh pulls him out of prison. And then Pharaoh elevates him in the government. After Joseph successfully interpreted those dreams for Pharaoh, Pharaoh made his life so much better than it had been before. Pharaoh gave him a wife. Pharaoh gave him a new, new name. Pharaoh gave him a new job. What kind of person helps you find a wife, gives you a name, gives you a job in the family business? A father does those things. So, speaking of a father, how does Pharaoh first get to know Joseph? by the interpretation of his dreams. He comes and says, Joseph, can you interpret my dreams? What was the last topic of conversation were recorded with Jacob 
his father before he's kidnapped. He was talking about his dreams. And Jacob was scoffing at the idea that he and all of his family would bow down to Joseph. So, in many ways, Pharaoh is like a father to Joseph. So, in Joseph, we see he's torn. He really has two fathers. And as he makes this promise to Jacob, he is really committing himself to his identity. Yes, I am your son. I will honor you as my father. I, I've been in Egypt. I've been elevated in Egypt. Pharaoh has done all these things for me, but I am still your son. And so part of what we see here really is Joseph choosing to hold fast to the culture, beliefs, and heritage of his true family even though he is so ingrained in the culture of Egypt. He tries to make it easy for Pharaoh, but he is going to honor his father. Pharaoh agrees to the funeral trip, and we look in chapter 50, verse 7. So Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court, all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and herds were left in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went up with them. It was a very large company. So all the officials of Egypt come out for this great grand ceremony for the funeral of Jacob. I've been over in England when they have the official birthday of Queen Elizabeth. They call it the Trooping of the Color. And they bring out all the royal guards and all their... Uh, dress uniforms and they line all the streets with uh, all the the Buckingham Palace guards and their big bearskin hats and it is a grand celebration think about what it must have looked like for this grand celebration leaving Egypt traveling through Saudi Arabia all the way up into Canaan Israel for this funeral and they even bring along their chariots and archers and honor guard escorting this celebration. In verse 11, we see the Canaanites are looking on, watching this great funeral celebration. So the story of Jacob's burial is really the story of two heroes in the ceremony. First is Joseph, who risks everything to bury his father according to his father's wishes, he chooses to say, Jacob, you're my father. I'm going to honor you. Even though I've got all this power of Egypt, I'm still your son. But another hero that we often miss is Pharaoh, who chooses to not only allow this funeral to take place, but to join in and celebrate, to send out the honor guard, to make this a grand occasion for the whole nation of Egypt. The humility evidenced by this Pharaoh is so amazing when we contrast it to a Pharaoh a number of years later when Moses comes down, a Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph, a Pharaoh who has a very different attitude, a Pharaoh who has enslaved the Jews. And when Moses says, can we go worship God? He says, no. You're... Moses didn't even ask to be exiled. He says, we just want to go out into the wilderness a few days and, and worship our God. And Pharaoh says, you're not going. In fact, if you've got enough time on your hands, you can find your straw, make your own bricks. What a different Pharaoh than the Pharaoh of Joseph. So really, two Pharaohs, or, or two heroes, Joseph who chooses to identify as his father's son and honors his father's wishes, but Pharaoh, who also joins in the celebration as well. But then in verse 14, we see, though, another lesson from Joseph. Joseph goes on with his life. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt together with his brothers and all the others who had gone with him to bury his father. So after three months of mourning and embalming and traveling and ceremony, Joseph goes back to Egypt and goes on with his life. And that is a step that many people struggle with. 
There are some who struggle by not showing any emotion, but others, on the other hand, who can never seem to go on with life, who always are haunted by the death of the loved ones. I knew someone in Fort Wayne who almost every time they talked to them, you talked to them, they wanted to talk about the day their mother died and all those haunted memories, and they just couldn't move on with their life. Yes, we still remember, but we continue on with life. So the chapter goes on to show us that Joseph does just that. He continues on with life. He first of all lives with grace. The account is given of Joseph's brothers coming to him, coming to, and they come and say, you know, Dad said before he died that you should forgive us. Did Jacob say that? We don't know. It's not a, recorded in Scripture anywhere. It's possible. But if the brothers had any doubts about Joseph's sincerity in his forgiveness, verse 21, and he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Like Joseph, we get the chance every day to speak to others with kindness, with grace, with blessing. To those who wrong us, to those who treat us mean, to those who talk about us behind our back. Somebody comes to us and says, you should hear the way so-and-so is talking about you. Well, we choose to offer grace. We choose to give unmerited favor. We choose to bless those who persecute us. And so that was what Joseph chose. He chose to live a life of grace. Do you have grace for others? Those who are thorns in your side, did you choose blessing for them? We learn from Joseph to let grace be a part of her life. Secondly, Joseph lives with hope. In verses 22 to 26, we see Joseph spends 93 years of his life in Egypt, another 36 years after he buries his father. But as Joseph comes close to death, he also extracts a promise from his family. Verse 25, And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph also is looking for God to work. He says, you're not going to stay here in Egypt. God's going to bring us back to Canaan. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the great faith chapter, verse 22, reminds us that this was not just funeral planning. This was an act of faith. It says there, by faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. So Joseph had faith just like his father Jacob. We're not going to stay here. God's going to bring us back. God promised it. We can trust God. We can believe in God. And so verse 26, after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So Genesis ends with Joseph in a coffin in Egypt. But that coffin was a sign of hope. Because whenever the Jews saw that coffin, they would be reminded of the promise that Joseph said that we're going to take his body back to Canaan when God brings us out. So when a new Pharaoh arises who oppresses the Jews, makes them slaves, makes them gather their own straw to bake the bricks, they could still look at that coffin. And that coffin would give them hope. Joseph had faith and he had hope. Hope is the anticipation of what faith believes. Faith is when we believe something. Hope is when we say, because I believe it, I look forward to it every day. Even as we've begun our service. Jesus is coming back for us. Because I believe it, every day I live in hope. Today might be the day. He might come before we leave the sanctuary. Maybe before I go to bed tonight, Jesus is going to return. Hope, living in expectancy. And 
Hope is what helps us to rejoice even in the midst of trials. No matter what life throws at us, we know God is with us. God is for us. God is working on our behalf. We can look to our God to work. So funerals are one of the greatest times to remember what we know to be true. And as a result of remembering, we live in hope. When we had my mother's funeral service in January, her neighbor across the street came and said, it hardly seems like a funeral. Nobody here is crying. Why was that? Well, yes, we grieved the loss of my mother, but my mother's faith was so strong, so confident. And all my brothers, our faith is in God. We know we'll see my, my mother again. We know we'll see my father again. We look forward to being gathered together to our people. Funerals can be wonderful times of rejoicing when we live in hope. Paul says, yes, we grieve, but we do not grieve like others who have no hope. We grieve in hope. Yes, we, we miss the loved one dearly, but we continue on knowing we can see them again. So very quickly in closing, what helps us through the grief process? When a loved one has died, what gives us help? First of all, be still and know that he is God. In Psalm 46, the writer talks about the earth giving way, waters roaring, the mountains quaking and falling into the heart of the sea. Not a bad description for what the turmoil that goes through our hearts when we lose a loved one. Such heart-wrenching sorrow. And yet, that psalm reminds us God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, it makes sense to be still and know that I am God. Or at difficult times, we remember to place our hope in God. Secondly, what helps us with grieving? Giving thanks. Giving thanks might be the last thing on our minds when we lose someone we love. But even in days of sorrow, we remember, as Psalm 23 reminds us, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the more time we spend praising God and thanking God, the less time we spend complaining and resenting and turning to bitterness. So instead of resenting all the opportunities we no longer have we we take time to thank god for the time we had with that loved one we thank god for the influence they had on our life we spend time giving thanks the more we give thanks the more positive our outlook will be and then thirdly do something for somebody else the temptation is at times of grief to pull in and think, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Oh, I'm just so devastated. But let's realize that when a loved one dies, we're not the only one who's grieving. There are so many others who grieve along with us. Whenever you think about how bad your situation is in life, remember there's somebody else who's got it worse off than you. Instead of wallowing in self-pity, Seek to be a blessing to somebody else. In fact, that's what Isaiah 58 tells us. Isaiah says, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire with good things and make your bones strong and you should be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. You shall be called a repairer of the breach, a restorer of streets to dwell in. In other words, Isaiah is saying, when you choose to bless others, you will be blessed. Instead of waiting for everybody to come to minister to you, seek to bless somebody else. And as a result, 
you will be the one who is blessed. St. Francis of Assisi has a famous prayer that goes like this. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. Let's seek to be a blessing to others because as we bless others, we in turn will be blessed. As we think about death and consider the death of those we love, let's make those times times of great victory, times of great celebration. We learn from the lesson of Joseph. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that as Christians, death is not a tragedy, death is a triumph. And Lord, it is our hope today to be gathered to our people, to be gathered with your saints and to enjoy your presence forever. Thank you, Lord, for the way we see Joseph choosing to honor his father, choosing to honor you, and it's our desire to do the same thing in our lives as well. We thank you, Lord, for these lessons we've seen today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us if you're able to. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful that death is not the end, that you are, have gone and prepared a place for us, that someday you will come back on the clouds and we will see you in the air, and we rejoice in that fact. Lord, give us hope, and that we may be hope to those around us, and that we may say, as John said, yes, come quickly, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.